Oh, hi there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zinga Show, episode number 176, with me, your host, Agostino Zinga. How you doing? How you feeling? Great. Good to know. I'm feeling amazing. As you can tell, this is the second episode in one day because I'm feeling hot like that. I'm coming in spicy. I thought to myself, you know what? If Joe Rogan can do it, so can I. We're basically the same person, minus the skin color and maybe the bank account. But apart from that, we're very, very similar. So if he can do it, why can't I do it? So here I am, second time around, coming at you hot, coming at you strong, live and direct from Stratford is that way. Um, over that side is another place that I don't know because I've not got my directions out that great. Um, I don't have a really good sense of self and sense of place or I don't really have an inbuilt compass inside of me because I'm not a weirdo. But apart from that, I'm feeling good, feeling nice. Um, today's weather's brightened up a little bit. If you would have heard um, today's podcast in the morning, you would have known that this morning was extremely muggy, extremely wet, extremely grey, extremely London, <laughs> extremely United Kingdom. Um, no surprise there. But, you know, it's a little bit disconcerting. You know, we're in April now. Um, festival season is fast approaching. Day parties are fast approaching. There's loads of open air barbecue food festival type nonsense things that people go to if they read the Time Out magazine or if they like to um, do geolocations on the places they are at and post videos of themselves eating fucking stupid crepes and you know getting something made or I don't know buying handmade jewelry those kind of people are going to be pissed because the weather is not great for them right because they can't go to Columbia for Columbia uh, Road Market and buy fucking overpriced flowers to put in their overpriced apartment to impress their friends who are you know whatever that everything's falling flat we're all suffering right I'm suffering because it's making me grumpy and I'm berating people who go out and buy flowers for themselves on the weekend and it's making the people that buy flowers on the weekend in order to get likes and to reach a new audience and to show off some of their hashtag skills and do that annoying dot 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 thing on the comments anyone else annoyed by that five dot thing to hide the, to hide the hashtags they're not hidden I always see them shits just post your hashtags man post your hashtags that dot 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 thing just fucking longs it out. It doesn't hide hashtags. It just keeps them going. Keeps them going and going and going. It's like, we all know SEO. We all know social media manager. We've all been to, we've all watched a couple of YouTube videos about how to market yourself on social media. We know what you're doing. Just be unabashed by it and upload them. People that I don't, I don't mind on social are the ones that are just like upfront, right? The upfront corny, um, all about me, 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 me. Um, they're kind of portraying themselves as they live in like their, you know, their own version of their own reality TV show. I like that. I prefer when you're just upfront and you're, you know, you're corny, you're cheesy, you're a cornball, you're a, what's the F boy, whatever they call them um, on the internet, on the forums and stuff. If that's you, be you, live your authentic self. But what I don't want to see is you hiding the hashtags, right? Don't hide the hashtags. Don't hide them. Just show them where they are, right? Just be who you are. Tag everyone on the picture. Tag me if you, if, no, actually don't tag me. Those people that do that thing where they want to, they're tagging the picture so you can like their picture immediately. When I do that, when you do that to me, just, just know if you tag me in your picture for you to like it, I'm going to report your picture. <laughs> I'm going to report your picture. We're going to copyright strike your picture. Oh, uh, you know, what the fuck? What my picture get taken down for? There's a picture of you eating avocados. I'm just going to report that shit, man. Oh, obscene. I mean, spam. <laughs> But yeah, I hope you guys are well. I'm feeling good, as you can tell. I'm in a great mood. Um, so um, I was just thinking earlier, right, about my um little DJ set that I did the other day, um, at my night called Labatees at the Heathcote and Star. For those of you that have missed it, and for those of you that weren't around, for those of you that kick yourself and say, "Oh my God, I just need you to tell me about you playing a DJ set," and you're like, "Oh my God, I should have seen you play." Don't worry, plenty more opportunities to come here, my friends. But, um, um, again, you know, it's just a minor little thing. It's something I play in a bar, in a pub, and I think I mentioned it to a few friends or to a few people I was talking to. Again, I need to stop using the friends thing. Anyone else annoyed by the friends thing? It's not, maybe it's just me, right? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a cynical dude. I'm not as, um, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not that kind of guy. But I, I just try and be, I just try my best to be precise and careful with my language. Maybe it's because of my speech. Maybe it's because I've, you know, I followed Jordan Peterson in the last few years, and I've seen how much stick he's been getting from the media, even though he tr goes out of his way, um, to try and be precise in what he says and how he says things, um, where he's at, um, who he's talking to, um, how he's being framed, whatever it may be, right? He's always very particular about how um, he comes across. So maybe that's kind of um, influenced me in some regard. But there's something about that whole friend thing. I think maybe in the scene, because, you know, now nowadays, as I mentioned to you previously in another episode about the article that I read about um, 
I think it was a report that they made about most contemporary artists um, usually make it based on their network as opposed to their actual skill. I don't know how, I don't know how they quantify the report. I don't know how they put it together. But if that's a general hypothesis, then I tend to agree with it, right? I think we all we mostly do agree with it because I think even even though I don't count myself as cynical, I know we all have cynical friends, right? The friend that's always complaining about something, that's always moaning that they should be there, that that person's shit, but you know that kind of annoying person, right? And if you look at it honestly and you kind of, you know, let, let, let's say you put yourself in their shoes or the person that's complaining, there might be some reason to it, right? There might be some validity to the idea that, you know, this person's only there because they know he or she, right? And my work is better. That could be true. But unfortunately, in the day and age that we live in now, with every prep, with every celebrity essentially being their own publicist right um being their own manager in some way shape or form because you know if you're getting if you're getting a proposals or offers from on instagram from companies essentially you are your own kind of manager in that sense, right because you're kind of fielding through the offers and seeing what kind of resonates what makes sense to you collaborations brand endorsements whatever maybe consultancy stuff if that's the case then what we've seen now with this advent of social media is that you have to be you have to have that 360 vision you have to be all encompassing you can't just be the artist anymore you have to have a finger on a pulse on different on, on all these different sort of things right and i guess sometimes if you're a talented artist and you're saying to yourself you know you're in your room somewhere in the middle of brooklyn and you're bemoaning that this person is you know getting much more press than you or is getting all the features you have to then start questioning what are you doing not to get those press and features right if it's just simply about being in certain rooms then just take a trip and go to certain places. I've always said it. If I was, if I wanted to be an influencer, that's the first thing I would do. Instead of saving money to go to Coachella, or, or no, Coachella is a good example. Instead of saving money to go to like other bullshit things, I'll just save up money and I'll do the whole. Um, I think Heron Preston might have a tea about it, right? Did Heron Preston have a tea about Heron Preston influencer world tour? Where is it? Let me see if I can find it. Remember, Heron Preston had a tea about it. That I thought would be a good idea for someone to just you know take. And sort of use it as a way to tour everything. Where was it? I think he had a t-shirt or something. Um, influence. Hold on, let me see if I can find the influencer shirt. Let's see if I can find this stuff. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Influencer All City, right? Is that the one? Yeah, I think that's the one. Influencer Jetstream. Let's see if I can find Let's see if it's got all the things on it. Yeah, so this is the one, right? Okay, found it. Okay, so um, Heron Preston has this T-shirt, right, that I thought was a fucking clever, clever idea. And again, you know, him being, I think that's probably the reason why he's been so successful, that he's not really a fashion dude. He's come out here from just like a cultural connector, a marketeer, a brand dude. He's kind of been able to fuse all those different interests and kind of present it in the medium of fashion, which is probably why he kind of, you know, adopts this whole idea of like it being an art project. A lot of people say it and it kind of comes across a bit wanky. It comes across a bit, you know, a little bit self-congratulatory. It comes across a bit like you're trying to intellectualize screen print and tease, but you can really see it in Heron Preston's work that he's actually coming across it from an artistic point of view. But I've always said like for my friends that always complain about stuff and, you know, moaning about situations they're in or things that they're not doing or where they should be in life i've always kind of had the adage that you know just look at what the things that you're not doing or sorry look at the person that you're hating on or you think has you know got their place unwarranted and just look at the things that they're doing outside of just the craft forget even the the craft what they're doing whether it's djing whether it's making art whether it's writing whether it's presenting whether it's being a, a photographer whatever it may be forget the actual work and look at what they're doing outside of it and look at and write a list of them just check just make a little list da, 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 da. And see what you're doing or not doing from that list. Then make another list and see what you're comfortable, to, what you'd be comfortable to do in order to get yourself where you want to get to. And then maybe make another list where you're you're able to do something where you, you know swallow your pride a bit and make another list that you could actually do and think you know what even though I'm gonna cringe like hell and I hate these people I don't want to be around them I need to go to at least a couple of them things and I think a good tip a good kind of starting point would be this T-shirt from Heron Preston that he did right it's, it's the um I think it's the influencer all city right it's a really funny T-shirt I'm not sure if it if it sold well or if people got it and stuff like that but I remember when I saw it first time round it kind of made me laugh and it was kind of very on point with what's kind of happening and it's like this T-shirt says influencer all city and there was one that basically had a list of all the places that influencers are, tend to go when it's kind of influencer season right and that usually starts from about i think from april right from when um coachella starts that's basically the first time you see every, all the influencers out doing their thing and this is kind of a good example of it let me see if i can get it out into a new tab and see if i can get the full picture of it so this is the influencer influencer jet stream right so if you're an influencer out there and you want to your kid you're like oh my god man i haven't got a chance no one's giving me an opportunity to do things this is what you need to do right 
these are the places that you should be going to just as a look when it kind of stuff is hotting up, right? Um, Coachella, Miami Art Basel, Fashion, uh, Fashion Week, Burning Man, Grammys, um, Weekend Caviar, Casper, the Oscars, Cannes Film Festival, Ibiza, Cipriani Social, Barts, um, Tulum Freeze Art Fair, Tulum Freeze, Tulum Freeze, Paris, London, and Fashion, uh, whatever, New York um, Fashion Week, right? Um, uh, Book Fair, PS1, uh, The Box, Mr. Chow's, Carbone, The Mercer Hotel, Amara Mora, Momo Hotel, Costas, No Name, Ch No Name, Chateau Marmont, La, La Baron, The Standard, Boom Boom, uh, Boom Room, sorry, Sub, um, Mercer, Bar Petty, Cafe, um, Cafe what? Or is it, is it, is it Bar Petit or Cafe Ferdi? Cafe, uh, Matashuya, Nobu, Malibu, Soho House, Levanu, John and Vinny's, Oak, um, Up and Down, Cerulean Tower Hotel. So if you're an influencer out there and you're, again, you're bemoaning the fact that these people are ahead of you and they're doing more things than you should be doing, this is essentially your cheat sheet in order to go where you need to get to. Now, again, do you have the funds to do it? Are you able to sacrifice maybe not going to the trendy festival that your friends are going to and maybe, you know, going on your own to these kind of places and maybe linking up some kids that might be hanging around there? Because, again, it doesn't you don't necessarily need to get into any sort of places. This is the thing that kind of people don't really realize. You don't need to get into them, these places. You don't need to actually go inside Coachella. You don't actually. Well, maybe you need to, but. I think just the being around the vibe, being around the atmosphere, just soaking it all up is so important. I know for me, when I was first kind of get moving around in London and trying to connect with people and trying to see where I could kind of fit in and where I could kind of do something, most of my time was just spent going to sneaker releases, going to exhibitions, going to store launches, going to um, um, capsule collection launches, going to um, sneaker events, what that meant at the time, but a couple that Crooked Tongues did, um, going to a book launch, going to an art exhibition I mentioned before, right? Going to maybe a gig of a particular artist, like, I don't know, when Subtrack first come up on the scene, you know, a lot of kind of cool um, in the know people wanted to be the first person to kind of see him play. Now, probably not more, not so much because, you know, he's, he's basically a huge 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 pop star now for the most part in that kind of electronic field but going to see certain artists who are kind of in the kind of cultural zeitgeist and just being in and amongst the mix and seeing these people in real life and i think there's something about and again you don't need to say hello you don't need to introduce yourself you can maybe spy you can maybe do a head nod you don't even need to talk to them just being in and around it and maybe forging a new community for yourself i would say it's probably more advantageous instead of going there and talking to the you know the hair and presence of, of the world maybe it's more advantageous to talk to the other kid who's trying to get to Aaron Preston, who's got maybe a t-shirt, who's got maybe a line, and then probably like talking to, oh, shit, what's this thing you're about to give this dude? Oh, it's basically my brand, da, 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 da. You get talking, you get to help him out with something, or maybe you connect on the kind of just a friendship level. You just want to hang out, right? Because I know for me, personally growing up, especially in Stratford, especially in Canning Town, wherever you are really in the world, especially if you're in the industry, it doesn't matter where you are, it's quite hard to find people who have the same interests as you, who live locally, who are in the same area. So when you do meet them, even if it is people that are, don't live anywhere near you, but you end up being internet friends, you end up swapping um, IGs, you end up DMing each other, liking each other's pictures, just generally you know shooting the shit over the internet. It's a lot better than having nobody and just seeing stuff from the outside i think there's something to be gained even from even if you just want to be a consumer forget these you know forget these esoteric uh, lofty goals even if you just want to be a consumer i think there's something really advantageous about being there in the scene and soaking it all up right it just makes you a more discerning customer you come across a bit more legit you never know staff members in the store might treat you better because they know you're really about this life you're actually committed to knowing things you're asking the right questions you're trying to research stuff you're trying to get your knowledge up yeah like those things can go a long way and again you never know what the future may hold one or two questions here and there one or two um evenings spent in a shop hanging around after hours hanging out with these guys in the bar you never know what may happen it, it doesn't necessarily always have to be a monetary thing it doesn't necessarily need to be a career thing it's just the idea of that you know this thing that you've dedicated because again i think streetwear fashion music art um, um, DJing culture, nightlife culture. There's something very specific about it because we spend so much of our time obsessing about it. Like I know I do. Essentially, I do this podcast to just talk about the things that I love, right? Happen to all live in that world, right? I just kind of cover it in the number one streetwear podcast in the world because streetwear for me kind of encompasses all of those things in my idea, right? Because that's where I found out about techno through streetwear. I find out about DJing through streetwear. I find out about trainers through streetwear. I find out about art. All of that stuff is kind of and come and the umbrella. And I want to kind of reclaim it and not, you know, give it this kind of like poo pooey shitty existence. But I think there is something really to be gained about being in place. And I think nowadays, especially with the internet, especially with social media, it's kind of, you know, it's been a bit of a cheat sheet because you can just straight away get to these people and speak to them directly. But I think sometimes you're not really in a place to ask any good 
questions or you're, you're not in a place to be of any value from the internet sliding into someone's demons asking them if you if they can intern for you because you don't really know you don't even know what you want to do right you're just asking them for help because you feel as if like this thing that you've been obsessed about all your life for the most part of it or, for, or it feels like all your life you feel like you just want to be involved but you don't really know what you want to do yet. So I think the best thing to do to figure out what you want to do is just to be around shit, to get around it, see what it's like. It's like um, it's like when you're um, have you ever had the same ambitions as your friend, and then they end up working there, and they tell you how it really is, and you suddenly get put off by it. It's happened quite a few times, to people, right? Like um, sometimes I don't know. It's like when you have, it's like when I had um had a dream. Oh, you know, you're younger, you have a dream that you're gonna work in game, right? The shop game because you're obsessed with computers. Then you finally end up working it. You realize, oh. Just like any other job, it's fucking garbage, right? Like, I like games, but I don't like working in the show. I just want to be involved in the gaming industry. So already, just from working there, you've already crossed one thing off your list. Okay, cool. Now I know I don't want to work in game. I want to work in the industry of computer games. That might be design. That might be being a community manager. That might be working in marketing. That might be whatever it might be, right? It might be being on the streamer, on Twitch or something. But it just takes actually doing it first. That's the main thing. But I honestly do think this influencer jet stream from Heron Preston I have on here on the screen is definitely an influence a cheat sheet i would call it right this is an influencer cheat sheet if you want to go out there and impact the world if you want to go out there and touch people you want to go out there and just be a part of the culture and you know get the opportunities that you want to get in life whatever you have to offer go to these places now it's going to take you maybe working a shitty job here and there it's going to take you sacrificing not buying the next fucking jordan one retro or the needless or the need uh needless pants or this new t-shirt or that new supreme it's gonna take you sacrificing a lot to get to these places because most of them are gonna cost you a lot of money not just not just the tickets but the flights and the accommodation alone you could always get cheap flights you could always um do a bit of couch surfing you could always hit up people on social and find out if anyone's going to the same thing and sleep on someone's couch there's things that you could do hustling wise but i think what is really important is really and again i think there's value in the kind of there's a lot of value that comes from actually saving some money and investing in yourself in this kind of influence instead of just sitting on instagram and the people especially if you don't know what you're doing i think some people don't, just don't know what they're doing they don't know what they want to do i watched this clip one time of i think dana white during a ufc press conference and one kid comes up to the microphone and he's like oh yeah i want to intern for you then i'll do anything but all right you know they're spewing that whole like you know hustler hustler talk and then it's like you know not convinced at first but then you kind of you know okay cool man no worries dude i'll, I'll I'll, I'll sort you out. Um, see me after and bring me your CV. And the dude's like, oh, actually, I don't have my CV on me now, but I'll talk to you later. It's like, what? Why did you make that whole... And, and again, I don't know if the kid lives locally from that press conference is. Let's say you travel. Let's say you drove two hours, an hour there. You drove two hours, an hour there. You had your you had it in your mind that you're going to get on that mic no matter what. You're going to ask Dana White, the president of the UFC, the shot caller there. You're going to ask him to intern there because you love MMA and you love everything about UFC. Then you finally get on the mic. You, you ask him the question. He kind of, you know, doesn't really vibe with you first. He kind of thinks you're a bit corny, he thinks a bit cheesy, he thinks it's a bit played out. He kind of, you know, he kind of, you know, acquiesces like, you know, cool. I'll give you a chance, kid. See me after give you a CV and you never have your CV with you. That's and that again is um it's not 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 for a shade of that kid but that is kind of symptomatic of most people online they don't really know what they want to do first they just want to they just want to reach out and ask a question first of all and it's not necessarily the best thing so honestly I recommend if you're an influencer then you want to or uh, um you know you want to kind of get on that you know escalator and it's again it's just it's always, it's always annoying these things isn't it when it happen because whenever the successful people you know get to where they want to get to they end up kind of turning around and poo-pooing names like even if i'm saying you want to be an influencer i'm 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 just gonna be right there i'm gonna be like cringy like oh, i don't want to be one but why not he got good good taste if you're usually on stuff early if you've got a good eye if you've got a good eye if you've got um a, an interesting point of view if you um are i don't know good you know you're maybe a charismatic person online um, there's something about you you've got a bit of star power about you online then why not um tap into the influencer thing it's not a bad thing but i guess you know when when the when the when the top tier people make it they usually always turn around and kind of shit on the thing that kind of made them what they were right it's just like come on man like ugh. but anyway um that's neither here or there but i recommend you check it out um this is a little there's a little i'll put a little link to the show for you guys what listening via the podcast but i recommend you check it out it's definitely a, a cool little t-shirt that heron Preston put together but i would call it the influencer cheat sheet not influencer jet stream but then this is basically a list of the stuff you need to do if you want to make it there um talking about reaching your dreams and doing what you want to do um so i was at my night um Labertees at the heathcote and star um the other weekend on saturday sorry um that just passed it was a fucking good night 
Here it is there. I'll show it up on the screen. I usually list all my events on, on high R8. R8 is a good place to list all my events because, you know, it's kind of acts as a kind of you know, living, breathing archive of, of all the gigs I've played in my life and stuff. Um, well, not all of them, but since kind of like post um, my days at Alibi. And these are kind of all going back from 2016. So that's when the Alibi sort of stuff stops around 2014, I think. Or 15, was it? And this is kind of me kind of doing my own thing from then on. So I've been kind of doing my own thing for uh, one, two, three, four years, basically, essentially, right? Outside of the alibi stuff, right? I've been doing myself kind of like near on four years. And um, one of those kind of nights I've been fortunate enough to do was at Heathcote and Star called Labertees. It's a bit annoying because, you know, I usually get called in last minute or come to cover for people. But, you know, that is the nature of the beast. Um, I'm kind of in my infancy. I'm not some, I don't really have much of a name. But, you know, by and large, I'm kind of slowly and surely be get, getting better and better and better. I'm honing my craft a lot. And I think in the beginning, the whole idea of me doing it was that I wanted to go somewhere and play for just regular folk, right? I, I always thought in my head that I knew I could kill it playing in the warehouse, playing for Dawson people. I know I can do that thing. I know because I've done it before. So special um, in my night, I did the alibi, the stuff I used to do at the corner shop. I've done it previously before. And I also know that even just with just effort and research, I could probably figure it out, right? Because most of those sets are like 30 minutes. No, sorry, I'm like between 50 to an hour and a half, right? So not that long. And if you know what you're doing, you can usually smash those sets quite easily. Um, but there's a real skill and a real ability in order to play a whole night, right? That's like two plus hours, really kind of cultivate the soundscape of the room. And I guess with me being a big fan of Berlin and, and, and that kind of techno scene and seeing the kind of appreciation for DJs they have there, especially resident DJs, it seemed like this was the perfect path that I wanted in order to kind of in, in order to have, have like a long career, right? If I wanted to be a, a trendy, fashionable pan kind of person, I'm sure I could have done that now. I probably wouldn't be comfortable to do it, but I'm sure if I wanted to do it, I could, right? In terms of wearing a wacky outfit, having an interesting name, maybe, you know, having a sense of style, uploading weird and interesting mixes. There could be a way I could, I could have done it quite easily. Um, getting a show on NTS, those kind of things. That there's a way that you could do it to be kind of like a scene dude. But I always wanted to be like the career DJ guy, right? I mentioned before to my friend the other day, I was saying, I'd rather be like a move D, right? Than a trendy hip hop, than a trendy sort of like DJ guy in the scene. Because a move D, even though he's not maybe well known outside of the heads that know about electronic music, he's booked at all the big festivals. He plays regularly in all the big cities that every DJ wants to play, especially the ones that have, you know, a bit of credibility or want to be recognized as good DJs in the scene. And generally, he gets to kind of do what he wants to do on his own kind of time and effort. Um, but of course, if you're the senior, if you're a social media trendy person, you also get the benefit of loads of brand endorsements, right? You're Peggy Goo, you get Nike putting billboards over you all over the place. You get brands wanting to work with you to make a clothing line. You get loads of things that come your way. But of course, that's not something that I kind of think has a lot of longevity, right? That kind of stuff is sort of flashing the pan because the next hot young thing that comes up would essentially take you off their perch. Um, so um, Labatees has been a great opportunity for me to kind of do my thing and do it in that way. And I think time and time again, I'm kind of learning how to do things. There's an, it was a, there's an interesting challenge that I face now at that night where essentially Labatees is in a Heathcote and Stars in Leightonstone. They've got a great um, beer garden in the back, right? And obviously the weather's warming up a bit, so it's usually quite busy in there. So on Saturday, like even on most days anyway, Friday, Saturday, whenever, whenever they have DJs on there, you have to be quite careful of how you play because the outside area closes at 10 o'clock, I'm going to say, right? And I start at 9. So you've got an hour to kind of play some good tunes. Um, they don't have a speaker outside in the garden because obviously of the sound complaints and stuff in London, draconian laws. But you have to kind of play enough good tunes that the people that are inside, the, that are outside the garden who are coming back in to take a piss or get a beer or order some food, they can be like, oh, this guy's actually playing some good music. And then once they close the, the beer garden and they make everyone come in, you want to hold their attention as they're walking through the bar because the beer garden's right at the back. They pass through the kind of games room. They pass through me playing the DJ and the doors at the end. So I'm kind of right in the middle. So you kind of wanting to hold their attention as they kind of walk through the bar. So it's been a challenge all these times to kind of like, you know, how do I start? What do I play? And I guess this time around, I kind of was like, you know what? I'm just going to go in hard. I went in hard and started out you know, 120 BPM playing disco stuff and new disco things. There's some, uh, some new cuts that I've had that I wanted to play for a while. And it kind of really worked, right? And that was, again, experience from playing in Dawson and having that kind of experience. But what really was exciting about playing there was that I kind of, the first time I played like um, Old Town Road by Little Nas X, right? And again, it's... um. 
it's a bit of a meme you know it's a song that kind of blew up on tiktok it's a song that has now kind of garnered some extra legs with the addition of billy ray Cyrus, billy ray cyrus on the track but there's something quite beautiful about that track that i just can't i just can't describe maybe it's because of my infatuation with um blood orange kind of you know um using the kind of cowboy motifs maybe it's the fact that I've been listening a lot of Solange and her kind of, you know, of course, their background, Beyonce Solange, their background of being from Houston and that and that kind of um, down south cowboy motif. Maybe it's the Travis Scott thing as well. He has a lot of horse riding. There's, a, there's been something in my head that's been kind of swaying me towards country music for a while, right? And I think a few years ago, I used to watch the CMAs quite regularly. I download it off a, on, on Pirate Bay, like, you know, however many gigabytes it was and watch it at home. And just I just like, you know, again, being a DJ, I think, is great because it just makes you curious about different kinds of music. You just want to just see what all the hype's about. You might not like everything, but you like to hear it. Um, I forgot the band that Pharrell collaborated with, but Pharrell even produced um, a few tracks on an album for uh, a, a group. I forgot their name. Who should I remember the name? I played a track of theirs a couple of times in my sets too. Um, either way, it got me really interested. And then the kind of apex of the situation... Uh, police driving past as per most things that happen in society the apex of it was the combination of it was this kind of track by Lil Nas X right and I got a chance to play it um during my set at Liberties and it went off so fucking well man people love the song they absolutely loved it and again man it's just there's something I think there's something quite beautiful about being able to play a song like that in a bar or pub with people who aren't hipsters and they just love the song some of them might have heard it, some of them might not have heard it. I'm not sure how it gets because again I don't listen to UK radio I might glance at the billboard charts here and there, but again, they're mostly to do with the US. So I don't really know how it's, what traction is picking up in the UK, if any, but they could really feel the vibe and they knew what they, they kind of liked it straight away, right? Um, and it's just like a, it's just like a really great moment to be in that situation and just feel, you know, feel as if like I've gotten to a place where now I'm playing the things that I want to play to a crowd that probably wouldn't want to hear what I want to play. But because I'm being able, because I'm able to kind of meet them in the middle with some of the tracks, they kind of trust me that enough that I can play, you know, a little Nas X tune. I can play a 30 minutes Afro beats set, whatever it may be. And I was kind of mixing it up and then towards the end, I kind of closed out with some garage, but which I don't necessarily like to play, but, you know, I kind of wanted to give them what they wanted. And I think that has been something I've kind of learned and kind of gained over the years, something that I've kind of been really appreciative of, especially on this level. Because, again, I think on paper, most people wouldn't take these sets, you know, they don't pay that much. Um, they're long hours. They're in places that no one would probably want to go to because everyone wants to go to Dorsten and Peckham and Shoreditch and Brixton and New Cross. Everyone wants to go to all the hip areas, maybe Manor House, um, wherever it may be called if you live in West. I don't know where people do in West London. But for the most part, no one would probably take these gigs, right? Because they're not really sexy on paper. But I think for me in general, just as, again, just as being as like a, it's a, it's a fun hobby that, you know, it's a, it's a hobby where they give you free drinks, Sometimes they give you drink tokens at a bar, other places. They give you some money for the time that you've been there. Usually the bartenders are fucking super cool. The bar, I mean, it's just like, a, it's just the best atmosphere for me. Because I think, especially in my past, having come from the service industry background, working um, or playing in a, in, a, in a bar or pub is my home. Because, you know, I probably relate more to service industry people, folk, who are just trying to, you know, earn a wage and go home and do their thing that they actually enjoy than the people that maybe work Monday to Friday in offices who kind of have a bit of an inflated sense of self, right? They think they're changing the world because they're the marketing manager of, I don't know, bounty chocolates and shit. And it's like, mate, not really. Do you know what I mean? But service industry people, they're a bit more black and white. They know exactly why they're there, right? They're there because it pays money. It pays well. It pays adequately. It, um, um, let's say the timetable is quite flexible so if you've got other interests that you want to do you can maybe ask your friend to cover your shift you can maybe ask to come in a bit two hours later it's not stringent as kind of you have to come in nine to five in the office where maybe and also it's, no one takes it too seriously you know you know you're not it's not your lifetime goal to work the rest of your life no one really takes it that seriously but yeah i'm a big fan of it um i love it and again something i've been really really thankful for but i have to really be honest like that little nas x tune went off that um, last Saturday, man, I was so happy to play that again. And maybe, maybe, just maybe, I might play again um, at Tap East this Friday. Um, at Tap East this Friday from a night called Tap, which you can see here on the screen. And again, I'm thinking, should I? I think I might actually put this all on my website. Actually, like all the flyers that I make, they're not, you know, they're not the most um, amazing things in the world, but still, you know, I make them myself. You know, these things that you could, you'd have to pay somebody some money to do. I think I probably still need to reach out to my. Um, 
So my friend Davian get him to actually make an actual what you call it, um, identity or whatever it's called, right? Um, for the actual night itself. But for what it is so far, it looks pretty cool. Um, I like it. Um, so that's tapped happening on Friday twelfth uh, at Tap East in Westfall. As you can see for the different flyer. I'm very happy with that. Hopefully, you can put that maybe on a jumper somewhere. But yeah, something I'm always happy about. Something I'm glad to always put out there in the ether. And something that brings me a lot of joy when it comes to going out and that, you know? Because again, I go out, I try to go as much as I can, I try to see DJs as much as I can. But being able to get paid to play these musics and to be on the same platform. Because, okay? you know, for me, it's like, you know, it's a win already. I might not be Nina Kravitz. I might not be Seth Troxler. I might not be uh, Dixon or Kravitz or Lobos. But my night's listed on Re Resonant Vibes like everyone else. And my name's listed on there too like everyone else. So what's to tell? You can't tell me I'm not the same. We're the same people. <laughs> He's the zeros that may be a little bit more longer than mine. But we're the same bloody person. I dare you to tell me anything different. Anyway, um, moving on in, moving on up. So, um, anyone seen that video of Brett the Hitman Hart getting tackled by some Looney Tune uh, during WrestleMania, right? Number one, if you're a man, if you're a grown-up and you're still watching WrestleMania, how? Just tell me how. How are you still watching WrestleMania? I just don't get it. How are you still watching wrestling? I just don't get it. Maybe it's a thing of like, um, maybe it's a consequence of the fact that gaming has kind of come up again, right? So, all the kind of you know, um, how would you call it? Not infantile, but all the sort of like childish things we used to do back in the day have sort of reared their ugly head again, right? They've all come back into vogue. And I guess if you're a wrestling fan, you're seeing all these gamers getting all the love and getting all the fucking money from Twitch and shit. And, you know, they're, they're going on Good Morning America and they're on Good Morning Britain and all this sort of stuff, all the traction on social. It's annoying because you've got your own little niche that you like, right? It's a bit, it's a bit cheesy, a bit corny, it's a bit dumb, but it's the only thing that you like. So you still go into wrestling. But I think with the advent of UFC MMA, with the advent of, you know, um, the jiu-jitsu thing that Eddie Brother, what is it, the Eddie Brother Invitational, right, all those sort of things, the event of um, other mixed martial arts organisations with boxing being um, better than it's ever been, like especially with most of the other divisions, maybe not heavyweight, but the other divisions are really cool and really stacked up and with just, you know, the access to other sports you can watch, streaming online, maybe except for baseball, like I just don't see where the appeal of wrestling would still come from, like it's not, it's even more faker than it looked back in the day, right? It's um, it's not, it's not. I think they kind of play on the fact that it's a bit pastiche. It's a bit like um, slapstick. And um, yeah, I just don't get it personally. But again, people got their things. WrestleMania was this weekend, and Bret the Hitman Hart was getting inducted into the WrestleMania, um, the WWE Hall of Fame, I'm assuming, right? And here he is, you know, doing his thing, setting his speech, and then this absolute loony tune of a fan decides to come in and rush the stage, rush the ring, basically. And what you're thinking with this video, watching it, is that you know, like. Of all the places to go and rush a stage, probably the wrestling match isn't probably the best thing to do, right? It's like someone coming in and trying to streak in the UFC octagon. Probably not the best place to do your political stance, right? Someone's going to clock, someone's just going to give you a spinning round that's kicked to the back of the temple and then you're going to be lights out, right? But here comes the video. Here he is. Absolute Looney Tune comes on stage and kind of tackles Bret Hitman Hart to the floor Why for some reason. And then Travis Brown, in the, I think that's Travis Brown in the suit there, gets on top of the guy and absolutely Pummels him, punch after punch after punch after punch after punch after punch. Right, he just gets on top of him and he's just like punching. And it's funny because they try and get him off him. Is this woman's talking nonsense? He's 26, supposedly. But it wasn't long before security and other wrestlers like Xavier Woods, Tyson Kidd, and Curtis. Look at look at Travis Brown just punching him repeatedly. At first, the audience looks stunned. I wish I wish we could see the. Let me tell you, I wish you could have seen a video or picture of the guy after this incident because it looks like he got absolutely smashed to smithereens. Because even when he's walking out, because now you know they're they're trash brown stones off and still banging and punching him in his head. They're dragging him out of the out of the out of the ring, and even when he's getting dragged out, he's still getting punched. Right? They're still punching him and uppercutting him again and again and again and again and again and again. It's just fucking insane how much he's getting hit up. Um, and again, I, I just don't know what kind of drives somebody to jump in a, a ring like that and tackle a wrestler, especially with all these kind of freaks outside the ring who may or may not be on PEDs or whatever it may be called. It's absolutely insane. Look, he's getting punched again, uppercut, punch in the face. Like, it's fucking insane how much he's getting hit. Um, again, I don't get, I don't get why he did it. It's just fucking insane. Like, everyone's just shocked looking at what's happening. Like, oh my God. 
just an incredible scenes um wrestlemania doing what wrestlemania does for the most part and especially that that kid's meant to be some sort of like wrestling fan or some shit um and I'm, sorry a rest, M- mma fan um he's a bit of a nut job it looks like from the sounds of what people are talking about online um there's people bringing up tweets of his where he's kind of you know been tweeting at various people from the wrestling organization and sending weird kind of messages to them most of which have been ignored but you know that's when trolls i think we've seen the evolution of trolls in it trolls actually coming um up up and from behind the computer and actually attacking people in real life which is quite scary considering how wacky trolls can be with most things um he's been charged with assault it seems like right this is on um where is it here jesus christ been charged with assault uh this guy's a fucking nut job <laughs> it felt like the right moment is this guy real <laughs> Let me put this on the screen. It felt like the right moment. What? To get yourself beaten up, you idiot. Like, oh, my God. Intense moments at the WWE oh, my God. This is absolutely Saturday insane. In absolutely Saturday insane. Night. Okay, let's pause it. We've already seen the video. But anyway, New York authorities say a spectator faces assault uh, and trespassing charges after tackling wrestler Brett Hitman Hart while giving his speech during a WWE Hall of Fame ceremony in Brooklyn. Uh, bells were set for $1,500 for Zachary Madison of Lincoln, Nebraska. At a hearing on Sunday, the judge also issued orders of protection barring Madison from approaching Hart, who wasn't hurt, and a security worker. Other wrestlers helped subdue the attacker. Hart resumed his speech. Yeah, subdue is one thing, mate. He got fucking lit up. Prosecutor said in court that Madison told police that he felt like it was the right moment to go after the wrestling legend. His lawyer said that he is agreeable and cooperative and has no criminal convictions. Debbie described Madison as an over-exuberant fan. Madison has previous run-ins with a fighter in Lincoln. The old post citing police records reports Madison actually stalking mixed martial arts artists. Harris, how can you stalk an MMA fighter? This is insane, isn't it? Several shocked onlookers posted footage of the incident online. Induction event resumed with Hart continuing his speech after the fan was taken to custody. At least one fan wasn't sure whether the attack was staged. Yeah, of course, the wrestling show. Second, like I remember that there was that time when I got really duped by this video. I'm not sure if, let me see if I can find it. But there was a video of um, Chris Jericho slapping a fan. And I got duped by it and I thought it was real, right? Chris Jericho slapping a fan. <laughs> It was fucking insane. It was in a car park somewhere. Somewhere I got duped by it. I saw it online. I thought it was real. Um, but obviously it wasn't. It was fucking all staged, right? Um, where is it? I think it might be this one. Let's see if I can get on and mute this. Unmute this, right? So I remember seeing this video online. And I thought this was real, but it wasn't. It was like, you know, it was all part of the fucking wrestling kind of game, right? The shebangs they play, which is quite cool, right? Because they basically don't get official. They basically let people on in the crowd record it. And they use that video as part of the promo. So these kind of potato recorded videos from really shitty smartphones. I didn't upload it, and they be and they and they frame part of the pro, they they frame part of the fucking narrative or storyline that Jericho would have next going on. And here he is, because <laughs> he did full he did full Chris Jericho gear, right? Don't know what his real name is, but he's not. You know what I mean? He slaps a fan, bro. Like shit, absolutely insane, absolutely nutcase, bro. Like they're on edge as fuck. So yeah, I remember seeing that and thinking that was real, and then someone telling me, "No, mate, it's all part of the fucking storyline, you idiot." And I was like, "Oh, whoops." But anyway, wrestling is wrestling is odd, man. I don't know how people still watch this sort of stuff. It's fucking bizarre. Maybe because it's like a live action movie, right? But it's like if somebody, it's like if they had like a Game of Thrones fighting championships. Would you actually watch that? Like, would you go around believing those people or could actually summon dragons and shit? That's a bit strange, right? They could actually, you know. Magic was real. That's a bit dodgy. I'm not sure if I would be your friend if that was something that you actually re- legitimately believed in. But again, maybe it's not me. Maybe it's not my business. But you know, it's not something I've kind of fully down with. I think there's other things I can be spending my time doing. But that goes without saying, right? Because mm-hmm. maybe my time isn't that valuable. <laughs> but yeah, absolute psycho of a man. I don't know what he was doing, what he was thinking. But it didn't go how he thought it would go. Next on the list, um, Jason Dill interview on GQ. I recommend you check it out. Maybe one of my favorite interviews of Jason Dill of yet. Um, as most of you would know or don't know, I'm a huge Jason Dill fan. Have been since, you know, the old school days when I used to kind of hang around at Slam City Skates. He was kind of my first kind of skateboarder crush. Someone I kind of looked up to and thought, you know what, I want to skate like him. Um, I want to push like Gino and I want to skate like um, Jason Dill. Just in general, just like a cool dude. And then, you know, he kind of went through his issues with time. Oh, what the fuck? What, who did you skate for? Was it Time Machine? It wasn't Time Machine, was it? What was it? Why did it escape me? What, what skate team did you leave? Ah. Oh. What did, what, what did he leave? I think someone someone's shouting it out now, right now, listening to the podcast. What team was he on before? Antihero, not Antihero. What was it? Alien Workshop, right? Alien Workshop, right? Yeah, is it Alien? 
I'm pretty sure it was Alien Workshop. Was it Alien? Was it Alien? I'm pretty sure it was Alien. Alien. I'm pretty sure it was Alien Workshop, right? Yeah. Anyway, anyway, so. anyway, it's a really good interview. I recommend you check it out. Um, it's a kind of it's it's good because it kind of really details um Jason Dill's re- Jason Jason Dill's relapses. I didn't know he had so many over the time because I know he was sober for a while and he was kind of putting out some of his best work. That's when he kind of formed uh fucking awesome where he kind of took it a bit more seriously and linked up with um AVE um or Jason Van Anglem or how you even pronounce his name and they kind of started to take um fucking awesome more seriously. They fleshed out the team. They got a team of absolute young killers there doing God work the merch sorry the clothing is really cool the decks are really interesting and very much um different from things that you see from other brands out there and generally it's just like they just carry themselves in a really good way but i recommend you check it out because it's a really good article that kind of again details his battle with drugs and, and alcohol addiction especially considering the kind of friends that he's lost over the years um that have kind of been in his circle that have kind of you know gone up and down or kind of you know suffered off the hands of um you know alcohol and all that malarkey but yeah it's an interesting dude kind of kind of obsessive right like all the all the fucking um water san pellegrino water bottles that exist all over his um room incredible skate team there as per usual loads of kids there that are very influential kids have their own brands kids are just kind of transcending skateboarding for the most part and just generally a cool dude and something someone that i've always kind of appreciated his kind of outlook on things and how he takes it you know and just the, the fact that he's not that the fact that um fucking awesome was never a thing that he kind of thought would become something full time right he'd always kind of done it as a side project he was kind of always a bit reluctant to kind of take it on and kind of carry it forward i remember i had the all over print fucking awesome hoodie back in the day the black and white one right and i remember even back then he was very reluctant to kind of make more stuff but then little by little i think he mentions about james james jebbia being the person who kind of really influenced him i think something like that right james jebbia where is it um uh yeah for years uh, yeah so i said let's read a bit here um it says here for on this article here for years deal explains fucking awesome would go in and out of dormancy i saw at one point uh if i even kept this up merely through the years it could stick around because i'd be tipped i'd be up and down on various drugs being the fun version of myself i thought i could be which you know we've all been in that place right where you take drugs you think you're the fun person that you think you could be but actually you're the worst person you could be because usually the people that are fun like me who are hyper like me probably don't shouldn't be taking drugs because if anything it kind of maybe exasperates the issue and makes you more of like people already say i'm a lot as it is right now sober right so imagine when you had drugs and alcohol into it it's just like an, an entire bomb so sometimes it's actually good to actually chill out right stay off the drugs and alcohol and just enjoy yourself right um and the feedback was always intensely positive once he recalls he was stopped while walking down bowery by supreme by final james jebbia i had one of those really bad hangovers it was the last person i wanted to see of course you know it's always like that and then when you always fucked up you always see someone you don't want to see but he pulled up in his car and he's like your stuff looks great it's a breath of fresh air in the store thank you and i was so fucking astounded i think i went around the corner and threw up <laughs> awesome 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 um the, the the party became darker in 2009 dash no died of a reported yeah that's one of his best friends as well heroin overdose and deal seemed dangerously close to similar faith that same year a steady diet of jameson's and percocet and vika did eventually caught up with him um there were times where it just was what you were supposed to do you're young and you have some dough you have you, um, you have no cares in the world says Pichelli. things escalated until all of a sudden deal was like wow i'm vomiting blood my esophagus is not connected to my stomach anymore i wonder how that happened <laughs> man it's fucking again i'm only laughing because you know deal's kind of a comedic character and all that sort of sense but it's fucking dark isn't it it's dark how far how d- deep um in the fucking dungeon in the fucking mud that we have to get as human beings in order to kind of turn our lives around right we don't get even from even in my experience right you get slapped in the face a couple of times in life and it you know it reminds you hey wake up don't do that shit again hey wake up don't do that shit again yeah life consistently slaps you in the face and tries to correct course for you but sometimes human nature or just the the nature of just being reckless the nature of just being maybe it's a creative is it a creative thing like impulsive you just you know you don't think through your decisions where i wouldn't really say that yeah maybe it is that maybe it's the impulsivity of it right you just you always kind of you know flying off the seat of your pants and then um, when things happen uh, that are kind of catastrophic, you can sometimes be a bit surprised. Oh my God, I can't believe that happened. But then, you know, when you're honest with yourself and really look into the issue and see what happened, you're like, you know what? 
how could I be surprised, right? What else did I think would happen? But there's also this idea that you don't really listen to the little corrections of course. You don't really listen to the little stuff on top of the head. What you listen to is when somebody fucking sweeps you and takes you on the ground and you bang your head off the side of the concrete. That's when you kind of wake up. And by then it might be too late. Um, as as per as we've seen with other examples, but luckily for Jason Doe it wasn't. And his friends were there kind of supporting him. I mean St. Los Angeles, a new deal began to take shape. He moved in with AVE who was a few steps ahead of Dill on the road to recovery, having hit rock bottom while drug addiction himself. It's it's kind of hard as well for these skaters too, isn't it, right? Imagine getting paid. Imagine being on salary to skateboard, right? It's a fucking bizarre profession because it's something that you don't necessarily deem to be a, a serious career, right? You don't necessarily... Some people deem it to be a sport, some people don't. But essentially, imagine being paid to skateboard very well, right? And you get paid to fly out places. You've got sponsors, you you know, you're on magazine covers, you've got your own little celebrity in the skate community. I'm not surprised most of these people... Um, fall into the addiction especially when it comes to um, alcohol and drugs there's just too much to, temptation there right and partly skate culture in some way shape or form maybe does you know maybe not promote but it does maybe glorify it does maybe um, you know it's part and parcel of the scene to kind of be a bit of a reckless cannon or you know a bit of a wreckhead in that regard and maybe not even um, actual wreckhead through drugs and alcohol but just to take risk right jumping uh, jumping um, I don't know dropping in from a, a you know, obscene heights or trying a particular trick that might, you know, end up you breaking your fucking femur. There are things that you do in skateboarding that kind of, you know, would lend themselves very well to kind of alcohol and drugs. They imagine being young. They imagine having like countless amounts of money or money that you've maybe never seen in your life before. I can see why they get involved in that. And it's really interesting that most of the big people, especially the, you know, the senior pros who have kind of, you know, still maintain a very kind of high profile and have got, you know, have had a long career for the most part, are completely sober. They just can't, you just can't do the both. You can't do both. Especially if you're trying to operate at a high level. Especially if you're actually taking it seriously and you want to get better and you're, you know, you're doing yoga, you're meditating, you're doing mobility exercises. The last thing you can be doing is, you know, drinking whiskey on a, on a fucking Tuesday morning, right? And and taking a couple of lines. You can't do that. It's just not going to be settled for you. So it's, so it's just interesting to see how these things have gone. They're trading in their crack pipes for protein shakes, which is fucking a mad line, isn't it? And started on a comeback that would ultimately lead to deal landing a, a second fresher cover in 2019. 2011, sorry, an AVE when it's covered to skateboard the year 2015. When Dill quit Alien Workshop and took AVE with him in 2013, it was a big news in skateboard and that was a bit second becoming, second beginning of fucking awesome. I didn't want to trust Dill I didn't want to. I didn't want. I didn't want to rust. Says Dill. So how do you avoid rusting? You keep moving. So I had to leave. The owner of the workshop. He was like my dad. So it felt like I had to move out of my dad's house. It was emotional. It was gnarly. Yeah, I remember it on the forums. Man. Big big news that. But like I said, I want to avoid rusting. I think that's what P Diddy said to once about his name changes. Right. He said like these name changes are basically his effort to kind of you know maintain relevancy to kind of keep himself fresh and to kind of give him because again every name is a different kind of persona for P Diddy. Right. He kind of fully adopts it when he's like the love guy, when he's like Diddy, when he's like P Diddy, when he's like Sean Puffy Combs. Like everything in complex, in capital basically has a certain, a certain character. I'm not even sure if, if looking back at it, if he has different haircuts. Maybe he does have different haircuts. But I like how every kind of name is like part of a different personality. And I guess for the same reason, you know, that deals mentioning this thing. You just, you know, in order to kind of keep reinventing, you have to keep yourself moving, keep yourself fresh, absorb yourself to new environments. But, you know, in some cases, when you do that, people around you are like, oh, you sold out. Oh, let the people behind, let the people behind you kind of were there for you and they need to be. And I remember that time on the forum, especially when I, used to, when I used to go on sidewalk, skate forum and slap back in the day. I remember that being a big, big thing within the community. People were really pissed off that he kind of decided to leave um, Alien, especially in the way that he did. Blah, 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 blah. But anything seemed quite well. Um, it, um, fucking awesome is where it should be and he's doing the lord's work with this amazing little skate team that he's got underneath his belt um what else here before we rock out ba, 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 ba. what should we talk about here bret hart jason deal um drum shed club okay cool this new club's opening up right called cool, drum shed i think him i mentioned it previously because i think um i don't know who's doing a festival here right so this is something i've just seen now on mix mag um kind of confirming the news but let's get it up on here Oh, Hope you guys can see this. Da, da, da. So, um, this is an article on for Mixed Mag magazine. 
uh, pioneering new event space. The drum shed is opening in London this summer, right? Um, a new venue called the drum shed is, is located, is scheduled to open um, in North London in June. The drum shed is located in the Meridian Water, the center of a major 20 year, 6 billion regeneration project from the Enfield Council. Wow. And we'll open the stores. Enfield's are far away though, isn't it, right? Open the stores, well, for me in East London. Open the stores for the first time in, um, for field day across. Yeah, I remember that's why it's, it's going to, that's what field day are going to do their thing. They're going to have it in this site that has all these warehouses houses that are interconnected and they're gonna it's gonna be quite interesting to have field day on a warehouse space location in different warehouse units is as opposed to what it's normally like in a big park with different stages and shit let's see how that goes um field day first teased the venue back in november when announcing its site relocation 2019 edition it's now been revealed to be a new venue uh from Baldwick venues the company that owns and runs london's print works and, and exhibition venues okay awesome the site features a 10,000 capacity indoor space yo man there has to be a bubble the bubble's gonna have to burst with these festivals isn't it Field Day is going to have a 10,000 capacity indoor space to do a festival for. Jesus Christ. It's going to be a lot in it. It's probably too many, no? Don't you think there's too many? I think there's too many warehouse spaces. or No, there's too many festivals happening. Especially the day ones. Um, I know Jazz, aren't Jazz Cafe doing a festival, for fuck's sake. This, like, this, uh, the Jazz Peterson Festival is probably not sold as well, I think, as it should have. Um... I'm, I'm still seeing them pushing them on social. It's still on kind of the first release. He probably, I probably think he probably thought he had a bigger pull than he maybe thought he has. Um, yeah, I don't know what's going to happen, man. It's, the bubble's going to have to burst one way or the other. Really. I don't think, I don't know how they can sustain this. Again, for me, I don't mind because I'm a nightlife dude. I like going out and stuff. So having more spaces that I can go to and, and rock out and chill is good. But for the people that are organizing these festivals, it's like, Jesus, man, how are you going to justify spending this kind of money to put these things on? Anyway, especially besides... The Tottenham marshes away from residential areas was also allowed to achieve a rarely seen combination of London loud sound levels and late night license. Okay, perfect. Um, similar to Fold, right? In that regard, the size of the warehouse structure will also allow... This is maybe tied in... Yeah, this is maybe a good idea in terms of the way I mentioned previously with Fold. I thought Fold was a good idea. It still is a great idea because it's a nightclub that is open until 6. Sometimes it has a 24-hour license so it can open, you know, um, from Friday all the way until, sun, all, all the way until uh, Saturday afternoon, Saturday morning. Um, that's amazing. But the best thing about it is because it's in Canning Town, it's in the kind of industrial kind of warehouse spaces where, I mean, area where all the kind of post office places are for the most part, the steel manufacturing areas are, um, it's away from all the residential areas so you can put the sound up really high. But also the license thing. I remember saying at the time when it opened, it would be great if we could replicate that same model in the north, in the south and in the west. Just pick an area and have a mega club sit there, right? So then essentially what you could do is that then you could go back to having the smaller clubs kind of start promoting resident, resident DJs and maybe the DJs that are on the B, C tier or D tier level and kind of get them up. Because I think the problem that we have, especially with some of the bigger DJs, and again, I'm speaking from somebody that's just like a, a pub bar DJ. I think if you're like a B, C, D tier level DJ, it probably is a bit annoying and hard for you to get set because for the most part, you're mostly warming up for the bigger dudes to come on later, right? You're not necessarily playing the main sets, but because most of these guys are playing the same clubs you're playing because there's only so many mega clubs in the U in the Lon in London, not that many for the most part anyway, that can kind of justify booking a Ricardo Velo boss and paying him the fee and having enough people in there to kind of make their money back or break even. It doesn't really exist, which is why most party promoters like Crank Brothers are kind of doing their kind of, you know, rechecked experiences and kind of, you know, spreading out a little bit more, getting into bigger spaces, using unconventional spaces to kind of make those things work. But nightclubs aren't really working that well. So I feel a good way to make nightclubs work is to kind of get these mega clubs in the east, north, west, and south. And then what you do with the Corsica Studios and with the um, X or Y or those kind of places and the Phonicas is that then you'd get the opportunity to have these local DJs play a bit more often in these places regularly. Because then it wouldn't matter, right? Because if you want to go out and see the biggest DJ in the world, you could still go to a fabric, you still go to a fold. You don't necessarily need to go to X or Y and expect to see, I don't know, Gerd Janssen playing there every weekend, right? It could be somebody else local who's as good, um, who's kind of hasn't got their name out there first. So that may be working in that regard, but I'm not sure about the festival thing again. But hey, what do I know? So as the way our structure will also allow the fitting of impressive production levels inspired by mega European events. Cool. Jump shed will be served transport wise by a new network rail overground awesome called meridian water that's also that's really good oh there'll be an overground there which opens in may five minutes from the site and we'll have a direct link to stratford and liverpool street okay i'm in i'm in i'm sold sorry i was um being um sorry i was being cynical there i'm sold if i can get oh, okay i'm sold i'm sold
Because already with Fold, right? The Jubilee line from Stratford takes you all the way to Canada Station and you have to walk 10 minutes to get to, to get to the place. On the way there, there's a couple of off-license. You can have a quick drink and boom, you're in the place. With this, you can get a, basically a train from bloody Stratford Overground and get straight away there. Or maybe even... Oh, that's amazing. That's so cool. Anyway, Broadwick Venues Managing Director Bradley Thompson said the Drumshed is Broadwick Venues' most ambitious project to date and a huge boost for the capital. Multiple warehouse spaces, the largest of which has 10,000 capacity space. Okay, that's the largest one, along with a 10 acre outdoor festival. So, okay, so Field Day won't be only in the warehouse, it, it won't only be in these mega metal units. It will be some bits outside too, which is good. I want to see how they, I want to see how they fit it out, interestingly enough, because I remember seeing the plans for. Uh, is it the Flughagen? What's that airport in Berlin that they were gonna um redo? There was an airport right next next to Neukölln. I've got the name of it. But I remember seeing the plans of it, thinking oh, that's really cool. That's a cool way to kind of use an airport, right? It's kind of be a bit more like interesting, not just have like portal cabin set up. So I'm interested to see how they kind of um um fit it out in general going forward, especially for field day. But hopefully it's not just like loads of banners with kind of sponsors on it. It's actually, you know, some interesting fixtures and fittings. We're confident people that people will be will be blown away by this as we are. Awesome. Night, like, oh, London's Nights are Amy Lammy pops up, eh? There she is. Oh, I'm delighted that the drum set is. I'm delighted drum set lady venues are open up in the capital and proud of the shares Enfield's commitment to living the male 24 hour vision of London. London's the most diverse nightlife culture. This thing she just repeats again and again. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Don't care about that. But yeah, that's opening up soon. Again, pictures of the warehouse space there. Looks amazing. I think London's hotting up, man. We're getting some actually cool, interesting places once and for all. I'm down for this like a motherfucker. Can't wait to see what else we get from it. But yeah, um, drum shed there by um, Bordwick Venues, who saw managed print works. It'd be cool to see what how it develops in the future going forward. But yeah, that was very interesting, isn't it? I'm very much involved in that, mate. Very much game with all of that that's going on there. Uh, but um, it's high there. What else I'm going to say to you? What else is good here? Let's see what else is on Mixed Mag actually. There might be some other DJ news that I might be interested to kind of check out and to see. There's a new read. The new fe- another new festival, Hide and Seek. Jesus Christ, man. How many festivals do we have? Like, surely these things can't be making money. Like, surely. It's impossible, right? Like, I don't know. It's like, it reminds me of the of the great, um, of the great, uh, of the great promoting days and I used to promote back in the day like everyone was doing nights right everyone was fucking then obviously some died off and some kind of rose to the the cream rose to the top but for the most part most people kind of died off right because there were just so many nights out there not enough people to kind of do the nights in general um what's I going to say to you uh so let's do this where, where is the AV inspired sound system let me see this for news festival called hide and seek right and it's in Sheffield which is maybe an interesting place to put it in Sheffield where is it hmm. in cheshire that's interesting maybe and let's say festivals what do they actually mean i don't know but anyway, let's let's see this here so um new festival hide and seek has op- announced its lineup right um uh, new festival hide and seek has announced its lineup touching down on the grounds of the chapelston hall cheshire on august the 31st hide and seek of future jeremy underground margot stigers um dan shake nicholas lutz matthew johnson live and priscilla which would be quite a good lineup there's also sets from jamie free 216 francesco de grande Iggy visions uh just make up spokesman and fair rise and voidman again are these you know these cheshire festival right there must be a lot of djs in that area that they could get to play maybe not have that kind of push but i don't know it's a bit international that lineup isn't it not that many local people playing this is outside and again this is this is the this is why that conversation about female djs in the scene is, is a bit redundant because it's not even a female dj thing even local djs aren't getting the opportunity to play here like how many record stores are there around um cheshire or that kind of surrounding area who's the kind of go-to person who puts on the most interesting nights in the area i'm sure there is someone that's doing something called interesting why don't get them involved um, again, I don't know that lineup. Maybe people on that lineup are really famous. Manchester's you and me are, have created a festival with parties, modular set one, and da, 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 all involved. Okay, cool. There's, there's that. There we go. I think that's those are basically all local promoters, right? Uh, modular set one twenty, Animal Crossing, Poku, Augmented, IQ, uh, Tranquil, Mango Club. Right, that's awesome. All of the parties will take place in Manchester. There's a set. Okay, great. I'm I'm cool with that. If you're gonna give all the all the big names the the sets at the actual site and the festival and the main stage or whatever, then give all the other parties to the local promoters and DJs. But it looks, again, looks interesting. Um, again, I'm not too sure how they're going to work, how they're going to make these 
fund and stuff, but no, not my business. But again, the site looks fucking beautiful, isn't it? No, wow, where is that? Uh, Chappers Fawn Hall, Cheshire. So, are they going to do it inside the actual building, or is it going to be in and around the surrounding um, lands? And again, this is cool because I think in in previous years there would have been maybe a bit more of a resistance from these people that own these buildings to have anyone do these kind of electronic events. But I think just because of the, of the I guess the maintenance that must make cost to keep this place running, having a a night come in and kind of give you some money to use your space is probably a good idea to do, especially if you can kind of agree on some sort of deal to kind of make sure nothing gets trashed and shit. And I just hope again, I, I don't know, do you? we're just a bit careless with our things and we don't really look after each other that well i'm hoping they're able to kind of educate people that are actually at the show to take care of each other and take care of the space because again this space is fucking awesome it reminds me of again loads of european um festivals that they have where they just do them outside of the main city center in very interesting historical spaces and again it kind of gives you another appreciation for the place that you're at the place you're visiting you get to see interesting things it, like the vibe is a bit more chilled out because it's not in the main city center i'm not sure how far cheshire is to get to manchester the main city center but it might not be that far might be coaches going there all in all looks fucking awesome man great lineup a uh, great location um, I'm a big fan of it, man. That was fucking beautiful, doesn't it? Really and truly. It looks very, very, very nice. Let me see what they're saying on the news. Part of it. RA. Da, 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 da. Yeah, it looks really cool, man. I'm a big fan of it. Ho hopefully, we get to see more of it going forward. But yeah, this is Hide and Seek Music and Arts Festival. They may say arts in it, but what, what do they actually do for the arts? Do they just have a couple of paintings on the side of a wall? But it would be good if it's a bit more immersive, in it? If it's an art thing. Maybe some live paint, maybe some actual curate exhibition. But again, what do I bloody know? Um, I think that might be it for the most part, right? I think that might be it. I think we might need to stop there and head off and continue on with the rest of our day. Is there anything else I want to mention here for the most part? AVA rolled into London. No, that's not something I want to talk about. There's a trailer for a new film that's been to come out, right? Did anyone see that one? A new kind of DJ-based film that um, I think I might want to see because I'm a sucker for... I don't know. I'm a sucker for DJ movies. I'm a sucker for nightlife movies. They're usually not that great, right? I've watched a couple. I've watched... Have you, watched, have you guys watched Beat? That one based on Berlin, kind of the club scene on Amazon. It kind of started off pretty well, then it kind of, kind of you know, fretted out for the most part. Uh, I didn't really kind of take a look at it anymore, but I'm a sucker for that sort of stuff. I don't know why, personally, but hey. We are who we are, innit? Um, where is it? Da, da, da. Is it not on there? No. Oh, there's a trailer for it somewhere. I just maybe saw it. Or maybe I'm, I'm bugging out here. But I remember seeing a trailer for it somewhere here. Like a little thing about a new DJ film that was meant to be coming out. Let me see if I can maybe get up here on the side. It might be able to come up here. Da, da, da. A future trailer. Yeah, there we go. There's a new official trailer for a movie. It's called Beats. Okay. Is it, is it the same thing from what it's called from Alab from the Berlin one? No? Huh. Or am I getting... Or am I going crazy here? Maybe I'm going crazy. I don't know. Let's see if I can find it. The trailer for... I think it's based on... I think it's a Scottish thing, right? Based on a Scottish club scene. Uh, it's a UK thing. Let me see if I can get up on YouTube and quickly maybe end it with that video for the most part. And we can all carry on with our day. Let's see. Here it is. Beats trailer. There we go. Yeah. Incident Mars May 17th. Let's get up on the screen. You guys can see. I'm sure they're going to get. Oh, it'd be good to get. Sure they're going to get all those other. Oh, Jack Mazzab. Jack Mazzab's around, but he's not in it. It'd be good to see him playing the other part for this. But anyway, um, let's get it up on the screen and play it. You guys can see and see what the vibe is. Boom, boom, boom. There. Someone's going to go off. Me and you, right? The Criminal Justice and Public Order Bill. You heard about this. They want to make it illegal to have gatherings around music wholly or predominantly characterised by the emission of a succession of repetitive beats. <laughs> Days. Steven Soderbergh, okay, yeah. awesome. Is it black and white too, that Roma? They want to privatize our minds. 
keep us in our separate boxes. This was fucking awesome, man. To the grave, the biggest night of your I'm really into it already. Is that a party? It's Coming of age party. Friday night. Oi! Come with an illegal move. Are you mental? It's like the back in the day, you have to call an actual line to find a location. Please, mate. I'm so down with this, man. I'm so down. Hello, Colin. It's about Jono. He won't be coming in today. He's, uh, he's dead. Aye, we're off your gutted light. I'll pass that on. <laughs> so cool. They want us to get in line, but we won't. They want us to be afraid of each other, but we're not. Yeah, that right. boy drag you down. Like bringing everyone together. Probably gonna have a bitter end to it, innit? But I don't mind. I'm down for it. Well, the oh, I'm waiting. Mo That's not like watching the movie. Because what do you want to go out? I can't wait now. Well, next big party for me is Junction. Oh, it's gonna be awesome. All this music. Oh, look at the music. That's gonna be part of it. Okay, I'm off. See you, everyone. Thanks for the show. Peace.